That'll be an interesting episode. I have absolutely no idea what any of you will be talking about. <laughs> We're just gonna talk in it like French. You're like, yeah, yep, <laughs> yeah. Just, heard, just I, keep drinking, Ed. Yeah. Have another. Have another. Yeah. Just give me the booze. I know that word. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody! Welcome to the second episode of the Exit Forty Four podcast. I'm Ty Lesher, the writer director. I would be Ed Marone, also writer, actor, producer. My name's Eric Brodor. I'm a producer and an editor. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> I'm doing fine. You've had, you had a rough uh, weekend. Yeah. What happened with you? Yeah, it's okay. Just some uh, pet issues. It's no big deal. Just stuff happens and you just got to deal with it. It was a situation that was exaggerated for... for uh, I guess vets like to do kind of weird things where... Uh, you bring your animal in, and um, they go, well, you know, you have two choices. You can either, uh, we can either put the animal down, or we can give them this nice. injection. And you go, wait, what? What What? What just happened? Why are there two options? Yeah, well, the vet, long story long, my, uh, my, my dog ate, swallowed one of those dental treats, and my vet thought it was a rawhide. And those are two totally different yeah, things. Right. Where the dental treats will be will be able to dissolve over time. It got stuck in my dog's esophagus, whereas a rawhide wouldn't. And they would they would have to literally go in there, either push it through the esophagus into the stomach, or they would have to go in there and extract it. And my vet, not knowing that it was a dental treat, uh, told me what like basically gave me the scenario where I think you need to contact your wife. And so it went from zero to 180 miles an hour in five seconds. And I'm outside calling my wife, telling her that she has to leave work and come. She's starting to cry. I was like, what the hell is going on here? And then uh, I went back in there and, I, and I'm trying to get all my thoughts together and my, my, my brain all together. And I said, well, what, what can we do here? You know, it, this can't be the scenario. It just can't. And he said, "Well, bring bring whatever you whatever she swallowed into the vet, and we'll take a look at it." So I had to go back home, come back. I gave her, I gave the vet the treat. They put it in some water, and it's slow. It's very very dense, uh, very very dense dental treat. Um, so that was one of the issues. But it did start to smooth out, and it started to kind of disintegrate slowly, and and. Um, they just ended up giving me some jelly, and we were just basically in putting that into my dog's mouth every hour, trying to get it to slide through into her stomach. And so it took it took a couple of days to get it through, and she was really sick. She was convulsing, and she was throwing up, and she was it was just a, like a nonstop attentive situation where I would sleep on the couch, and she would sleep on top, and she would just. I would wake up, she'd be throwing up. It was just, it was one of those scenarios where you were just hoping that everything was going to be okay. And so yesterday was going to be the follow-up exam where I scheduled an appointment for around 2 o'clock. And we were going to bring the dog in, take some x-rays and see if uh, it had passed and gone through the stomach. And literally 10 minutes before or 15 minutes before we were supposed to go to the vet, uh, she just snapped out of it. It's scary because you love your dog. You know, it's not a kid. I understand. I understand how, you know, you know, your kids get into stuff and you freak out. But but it sounds like you need a beer, Ed. Uh, we have a, a segment today that just happens to involve beer. Eric, do you do have you wanna... heroin, I can... We don't have heroin, unfortunately. Damn it. Do you have heroin? On me? No. Good. That's uh, very good. Uh, so, for those of you that haven't listened to the first episode, every week we try a new alcoholic adult beverage because Eric is an alcoholic. And Not true. <laughs> Not true. And uh, so this week we've got um, some beer to taste. So, Eric, you want to tell us what we got on hand? Yeah, I was going to try to keep us to some nice fine scotch, but I only had one out of two bottles of scotch. So I figured I would go for, since it's St. Patrick's Day today, the day that we are recording this, I uh, figured it would be a nice time to try a couple of stouts. So I have a couple yeah. of stouts here that will be fun to try. One of them is f- called the Wayward Penguin Milk Stout. Is that the, from, this one? Can we, I believe so. Uh, can you educate me on what a stout is? A stout is a... 
Very dark beer. Dark. It looks dark. Look at usually um, heavy. Some stouts are we got more of a bitter taste, and some some are sweeter. But it's more of a you know it's a darker beer. Um, uh, not bitter. Usually not a bitter flavor to them. Lower in alcohol. Okay. Nice seasonal thing. Um, I know way more about other types of beer than I do stouts. I could tell you a lot more about you know, ales and lagers, but stout is from the the little town called Stout. And uh, so right next to Cork, Ireland, uh, where they make cork, cork boards. Family with last name Stout, and they make stout. All right, so we have two stouts here. One of them is called Wayward Penguin Milk Stout from a brewery in San Diego uh, by the name of from the Council mil- Brewing. From the milk of penguins. And then the other one is uh, Zoko Vesa from Stone Brewing Company, also in San Diego. And they are actually two very different stouts because as soon as you have it, you will immediately... Vomit everywhere? No, it's a very different flavor palette. And the stone is uh, the stone is 8.1% alcohol by volume. And the Wayward Penguin is, I believe, 54 But I think I'm there's have completely a different time ones. than last week. <clears throat> so, uh, all right, why don't we... I think you should start with the Wayward Penguin because it is less of uh, something for your palate. Straight from the penguin's teeth. That's not bad. No, it's nice. I, mean, I don't it's, hate it. It's nice. It's the great thing about a stout is that there's not necessarily a lot of high. I can taste the Antarctic. Of alcohol in it. So I can taste the penguins. Yeah, I can taste the fear from running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, I like that one. Why don't you have some water over there? Clear your palate. Because <laughs> we know you're not. Your palate is very unseasoned. That is true. I'm very, I'm a very uncultured man. So now, it is just going to town. So okay. Yeah. No, this stuff. This I, I like the. Uh, this I is like the, the cover of the stone. I like the, uh, not the cover, the the can. Oh, the can. Well, yeah. Every every stone can is got its own unique brilliance this to it. This stuff's good. I don't like this one as much. Uh, so yeah. just uh, so everybody knows here, Imperial Stout inspired by Mexican hot chocolate. It is a stout brewed mm-hmm. with chocolate, coffee. Pasilla peppers, vanilla, cinnamon, and nutmeg. That's dangerous. That's like everything that I like, too. It's very dangerous. It's a great, It's got a good great, aftertaste. I'll oh, give it that. It's got everything. I don't it's like it. I've never, I've never tasted it before, but if I ever see it in the supermarket or somewhere where it's purchasable, I will purchase it. Here's a question. Drinking any kind of alcohol for me feels like heartburn going down. Well, then you need to do you? cocaine. If some people just can't drink alcohol, <laughs> some people are just hard ass drugs. Got it. Jump straight to cocaine. Yeah, we'll just we'll get you some lines. You Don't. do a couple of bumps. We'll send you. We'll send you to a club. That sounds fair. Yeah, that sounds like a good time. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So which ones do you guys like more? You liked the, I like the stone. Uh, oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Stone for sure. sure. That's why we 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 didn't pour you much out so that Ed and I could enjoy the rest of it. Of course. I mean that's. Yeah. The, the the intelligent thing to do. I want to grow hemp. Odd thing to say. No, I'm not joking. I'm serious. I I I've been using this CBD oil. Uh, it's it's great for me. I love it. I love how I love how it makes me. It has no THC in it, so you don't get high or anything like that. It's just strictly CBD from from the hemp plant and that you're growing yourself. No, 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 no. I purchase it. Oh. I want to. I would love to Why don't eventually. You? It's a shame Why? It doesn't can you can because I have tons of land in front of my house that I can just grow <laughs> hemp. Ty, I, I think I have what ten feet of land in front That's of my house, need, and right? most of it is rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Get the rocks out of there. I grow hemp on the side of my yeah. house. Yeah, what is that? It's L.A. You're yeah. in Hollywood. You can do whatever you want. I got a funny. I got a story for you. Okay, shoot. Uh, so on the side of my house, if you're familiar with my house, mm-hmm. um, it's that small. It, there's a small space between my house and my neighbor's house. And on the side of my house, I chain my uh, bike, my bike, my bicycle to uh, the the window guard on on my bedroom window because my bedroom. I only have one floor house. Um, and so uh, my wife and I usually go to sleep fairly early, around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. We wake up really early. And um, uh, my wife hears something in the middle of the night. And she thinks it's one of the animals, you know, running around, just, you know, ruckus. Uh, she hears it again and she wakes up and she goes to the window and she looks outside and there's this guy trying to cut. Oh, wow. 
the chain. Not it's not a chain. It's those um, like a big thick cable. It's a cable. Yeah, yeah those yeah. thick cables covered yeah, with cable pla- uh, rubber. Yeah, uh, it, and he's cutting through the the cable for your bike for my bike. <clears throat> and she goes, "Hey, where are you guys doing? What are you doing out there?" And he, and he he looks up, and she wakes me up, and I start cursing and I go run, and he books it, and he runs away, and he got so close. There was just like I think around four or five kind of uh, threads like left. Those yeah. strands, yeah. In in the in the cable before he just broke it and took my bike. So I, I can't. So I can't grow hemp on the side of my house. Well, someone's because gonna steal people, it even people, if you did. If someone, if someone got that close to yeah. you know ripping through a cable to steal a two hundred dollar bike, imagine what happens if they if they saw a field of hemp <laughs> on the side of my house. <laughs> What are we here to talk about? We're, so today we're going to talk about because uh, I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> today we're talking about how we find people to work on our projects and how other people can find people to work on their low budget projects. Um, before we get into that, though, I think let's update the listeners on Eleventh Hour Cleaning and the feature film that we're working on. Uh, so maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, since we last recorded, we had this this uh, as Eric dubbed it a come to Jesus moment. Um, that we realized we were kind of taking on too much and we needed to scale back and so together we got you know we we talked talked for a bit and threatened to quit i wanted to kill everyone uh but then we you know we got on the same page and we decided to just solely focus on getting 11th hour cleaning out the door um which i think is the important thing so we've been working hard on the visual effects uh, which I guess we should post some behind-the-scenes stuff on that on our website. Yeah, and well, part of the motivation for for that moment on that past Friday was the fact that going through where we're toward the final stages of post-production, and one of the things we needed to do was get visual effects artists on board and help us with some of these shots. But as we were just talking through the rest of what I had to get done, it you know it's also you know a long lot also have all these slack posts where we're talking about you know what's next what script we're going to work on next what are we going to shoot next all of these other upcoming projects and things to be planning for and working on then i've kind of just realized you know guys we just need to stop for a minute we need all hands on deck with getting our feature done and while those other projects are all great and need, need to happen they just need to happen a bit later they need to happen once we're further down the path and know that everything else is kind of going on uh, by itself and without us having to keep dragging you know it forward and so so it was more so of like hey let's just re what's most important you know what's what's the bigger priority right now and what's the next biggest priority and focus on those and then once we knock the big thing out then we'll keep going one of the main reasons why we were trying to get so much done as quickly as we were was because i'm having a baby and not me personally but uh you know my wife is having a baby in May, and I wanted to get another short shot and in you know in post production for us to work on because I felt like we were getting to a point where eleventh hour was going to be done and we needed something to be in post on, um, and but during our conversation we just kind of found out that it's we don't want to rush it. And I talked to Ed about this like this was a this was a concept that Ed really spearheaded and came up with, and I didn't want to sh- just shoot it to shoot it and do a poor job of it. Like I want to give it the time it deserves. Um, and so we'll probably push that back to July or August once the baby gets here and I've had, had some time to settle in. Um, but I think it's important for people to realize that you can't – putting more on your plate doesn't mean more is going to get done. It just means more is on your plate. Right. And, you know, in our case, you know, we all have a regular day, day job somewhere. And, and like me, if you work in the in- industry, then you have even less time in the evening because you're usually there for tw- 12 hours or yeah. so a day. And so – you, so it takes forever to get the projects done, your side projects done anyway. And then when you were trying to come up with a great plan of having more things to to do, it's just more things to take up a small amount of that takes up what little free time that each of us has. And so it really just came to the point of, you know, all these things are great. We're going to get to all of them. It's let's just stop putting ourselves under this crazy stress of doing you know, so we keep many setting Because Ed had said, hey, we keep setting all these dates and we just blow right past it. Which yeah. was what made me realize, you know, that maybe we just need to reassess what we're trying to accomplish and with what time that, that we have. And I think yeah. I think that was a great con- conversation. And really, and I think from that point, we really just did knock a whole bunch of stuff out in a pretty short um, um, amount yeah. of time. And, and to, to your credit, I think, like self, um, 
what is it? Self uh, awareness. Self awareness. Yeah, is important, and I think it's it's critical to us being successful at all. And you know, it it might seem like not you know oh we rescheduled the podcast and it's, we're gonna do it next week not this week oh we're gonna reshoot the drone footage next week not this week but that's one uh, one more week that goes by where nothing happens just because we postponed something and so when you brought up like we either need to not do the thing or do the thing when we said we were gonna do it and i give you credit for that because that's you. i think important for our long-term success. At the end of the day, what we're doing is not easy. That if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Right? Yeah. It's just it's a it's it's a very difficult situation to ha- live live a life, have a life, marriage, kids, whatever you have, and be able to try and complete something as difficult as what you know the business requires you to do, which is be creative, fight the power, and trying to get yourself. Uh, in it, you know, to make something because to make something you need money. In order to get money, you have to have connections. In order to and, and, and in order to to make something, you have to have a great idea. All that stuff takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of commitment. It's not an easy thing to do. It's easy to get, you know, it's easy to do a lot of other things. And so, you know, when you have family, you have commitment, and you have uh, an idea, and you want to put all this stuff together, and then you start adding more stuff on top of that. Yeah. You, you, you run into this problem where it's... We're already in a difficult situation. We're already in a difficult uh, business. And, you know, maybe one day we'll be able to do a lot of things at once because we'll be able to hire more people and do all this stuff. Right now we're in a situation where we can't do that. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Everybody gets a different deck of cards. This is the deck of cards that we have. We need to get to that. uh, I was going to say that you're... uh your point of you know we you have to do what you, what you can do now and not try to take on too much yeah. you know maybe when you can hire more people but i think a lot of filmmakers myself included get this grand idea of oh well we're going to do you know three films a year and a tv show and we look at seth seth rogan he's doing like eight eight movies and producing all these stuff but you don't think well no it's not just him it's not yeah. just ron it's not, howard it's yeah it's a whole bunch of people yeah. that they have that they pay yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Once you have, you know, if you have a sufficient amount of money and you get a way to, to, to get your bills paid and you can have this great budget for a uh, project, then, yeah, you hire people to do all of those things and things move along that smarter. And, you know, there are, and there are going to be those folks that are shooting all of these shorts and doing all of these things. And, you know, everybody's circumstance is different. Maybe they their life is set up in a way where they have the time for that. Mm-hmm. I, I think the film is progressing at a much faster pace i think we can get it out of our hands and into the hands of people who are next on the list and then we can start concentrating on on something else um which isn't i don't think that far down the road but um i like the pace that we set i like i like the accomplishments i like the steps that we've that we've um done even in the last, the last two weeks since we've had that conversation. Yeah, I and honestly, I think we got more done in the last two weeks than we probably have yeah. in a while. And and part of that, too, the other thing which I give you credit for, Ty, is you had acknowledged that you had not been as focused on getting certain things done with the film as well, which which yeah. takes a lot of courage to, to say, hey, you know what, guys, I, I could be working a lot harder and I haven't been and I apologize and I'm going to change that. And because that's a huge thing too. To, to it, it's okay, you know. What I mean, it's totally okay when deadlines don't get met. We just all have to be honest with ourselves as to why we didn't meet them. You know what, how we hold ourselves accountable, what we're going to then do differently. And I think for all of us, it all worked. I mean, Ed really stepped up with trying to get some VFX things sorted out, and you started doing some VFX tie while I was finishing locking the cut and getting it out to to our sound editor. So yeah, I think we really did a lot. The fact that when I made the comment, we're to a point where an all hands on deck, right? Meaning yeah. it doesn't matter what our, our what our specialties are, how can we all help move this along? And, uh, and another really great thing was when Ed said, hey, what else can can I do? Because Ed, Ed usually focuses on the writing, dealing with uh, actors, you know, and other other things behind the scenes. And when he said, hey, what? He says, I don't know much about VFX, but how can I help? 
So then, you know, you and I, Ty, came up with, you know, some language and ver verbiage of what we could start to email around and post on some uh, job boards about. And it's okay, great. Let me take that. And let me let me run that out there. And so he just took care of that and you know, reached out to a bunch of, uh, of uh, VFX and yeah. film schools. But just, you know, he really embodied that all hands on deck. And even though that's not my, this is not my comfort zone, I'll do it because this is all just has to get done. And that was, uh, was really great. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. It, it just at the end of the day, I think, I think we need to come together more as a team and understand that we have our strengths and weaknesses and to cheer each other on through, through those times to make us feel as if, you know, yeah, I might fail or I might do something that uh, might not help, but at least uh, at least I'm going through the motions and maybe I'll learn something at the end of this. Yeah. Or maybe I'll make a, a connection with somebody that I'll help later on, or maybe anything. You know, it's just uh, I think I think we all need to be on each other's side, regardless of uh, success or failure, and that'll help. That'll help down the road. Yeah. Because then we'll become more independent individuals on our own quest to try and make this thing happen together. Instead of having to rely on each other, asking questions and doing all this other stuff, this is a great learning experience for the next film, of course. Uh, I, I think the next film will be a lot more smoother. I think we, I think we'll we'll know exactly what we need to do, who we need to talk to, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're gonna talk about you know, the challenges in finding people to work with you on your either no budget or low budget project, and we sort of had a bit bit of an order to which we were gonna said take that through maybe casting to production crew to post and maybe now we'll just talk a little bit about visual effects because that was something we discovered was more challenging than we expected to get yeah. help with yeah um we already had relationships with uh composers and getting a composer on board was was not a problem uh, we also no. had relationships with sound editors and some of them were less easy to get on board, but uh, one of our old friends uh, rose to the occasion and is going to do a great job with us. And when it came to the visual effects, it was it was really a bit of an eye opener because while I realize through the bigger films which I've worked on, the visual effects folks are they really get the short end of the the deal because the the studios keep lowering budgets on what they're going to pay for vfx but that doesn't reduce the amount of work because there's still human there's still humans that are doing things like painting things out of scenes or animating things it's not all just you know artificially done with the computer um but at the same time there's a lot of people there's always a for one vfx house that closes down another two open up and and there's always people that need to get ex experience and want to get credit so when we needed some extra, some some help we figured all right let's try to reach out to, to some of these schools uh, uh, vfx school or film school and say hey we have this feature we, we don't have a lot we can offer for, for for pay but we're happy to trade that you know so, some pay and credits and whatnot and and i figured if i were a student and wanted to get my work out there I would be up for working free or low or no no pay. So Ed reached out to a ton of people, and uh, I think Ed, you, there was Zero. nothing back, right? Yeah. So far, got, nothing. Yeah, nothing. And and it was uh, and then um, other folks that I reached out to, uh, I was uh, I got some great great feedback from, and then some actionable items, and then didn't hear back from other folks and. Uh, we finally resorted to posting on a a internet job board, which I figured would be the least responsive. The least responsive. But it got a lot. Of, it got a lot of eyes. It got a lot uh, of. It got a lot of traffic. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't a uh, like a huge billboard of any of any sense. Sense where I, I had advertised something, you know, come work with us. You know, this person's done this, this, and that, and that person's done this, this, and that. I mean, I, I only I only did a small part of that. Not not like a huge. A huge introduction and you know we got over close to close to 100 people looking at it and, you know i mean but even that how many applications yeah. did we get out of that of two right we got two yeah. well and what's interesting <clears throat> too is that while nobody wants to work for 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 free or for very low pay at the same time depending where you are with your career that's just that's kind of how yeah. it works i mean we've all 
you start at the bottom, you know, whether you're starting at the, the mail room or as a, a, as a PA, you don't make a lot of money and you even intern for, for, for free. And then as you get the experience and you, your career grows and your pay grows with that. And I wonder if there's also a feeling of, well, I already, I've done these things as part of my por- portfolio. And so therefore I've already kind of paid my dues and I don't need yeah, to work course. for free or pay. Yeah. But, but until you're working at, at ILM, you know, I'm going to presume if you're still a student or recently gra- graduated, you know, uh, you probably haven't quite crossed that chasm yet of experience mm-hmm. and any yeah. opportunities you have to work on something uh, you need to take ad- advantage of. And I think when we all think that we're too good for a project, um, that doesn't bode well for your future career. And I think for two reasons. One is that you you don't know where someone else's career is going to go. Mm-hmm. You don't know who's going to be successful. I met somebody two years ago at a film festival. I was like, oh, you made a really good short. That's really cool. And two years later, like I lost touch with her, but two years later I found out that she's not been hired by Ava DuVernay to direct something like a feature and it's you know this this, these are people that i'm like oh i just met you at film festival it's a small film festival no big deal but anybody's career can take off at any point and to think you're above anybody else is is a bad idea i i think what people have to understand if if you if you have an interest in in getting involved in a project that doesn't pay a lot of money you need to understand that we're not we're not trying to screw you over we can't afford what what you know the going rate at that particular time for this particular film. Right. It's not as if we're hoarding all of this cash and saying, "Oh, we'll just you know we'll find people to do it for free." That that's not that's far from the truth. It's, yeah. There's no money to spread around. Yeah. This is you know it, we're trying to do the best that we can. Are you getting paid, Ty, for any of no. this? No. Are you? No. No. Are, uh, no one's getting paid. Well, and and some something else, you know. Even if uh, the point comes when we sell this film, you know, none of us. It's not like we've hit the lottery. No. I mean, with with <laughs> with paying back the people who have invested money in the film and and paying some of our crew who who worked for a a a deferred pay you know we're not all going to be suddenly driving around in ferraris and lamborghinis and buying a house on the uh the uh, beach and and i think it's easy for people to think oh well if if you sell this movie then you're going to be doing great well i mean there's some career opportunities maybe that that could open up but none of us are going to be retiring when you're making a low budget film that's the mindset that you have to have yeah because you know you you need to be of the of the mindset that I will pay you later, you know, and we can like we'll touch on some negotiating tactics and whatnot, and how we got some people to work for free and what we gave in, in return in a sec. But I think that you have to be of the mindset that you know everybody's doing this together, um, and nobody's getting super rich off of it. And the next film, you know, we'll have more money, we'll pay more people, yeah. we'll get more crew. But when you're making low budget films, you have to work with the cards that you're dealt to use your idiom uh and that's just kind of what we did so deferred pay is uh don't do it <laughs> <laughs> deferred pay is when uh you don't get paid up front you get paid a portion or you get paid a certain amount of money when the film makes money so you're banking on the idea that the film that you're working on is going to sell then it's going to make money then you're going to get paid in the future and in most cases, it doesn't happen, which is why it says don't do it. A lot of cases. Yeah. But most in, cases. In most <laughs> cases. But if you believe in the project and you think it's a good film or a good pilot or whatever it is, do it. And do it for deferred yeah. pay. If because you're passionate you, about what you're, what, you know, being a part of a group of people to get things done, then I wouldn't worry about the money at, yeah. at this particular moment. Build uh, up a resume. Yeah. Unless you're, you know already working on some big stuff but eric works on big stuff and he still works for deferred pay right. and for free and i mean he has a larger stake in the film but still that's the case you know and um another thing that we did with our crew uh to kind of get everybody to come on board of a low budget film is we paid everybody the same thing um i'm not a lawyer none of us are lawyers but this was a, this is a <clears throat> clause that was in our contract called a favored nations clause and that's just, it says, everybody's getting paid the same amount that you're getting. If anybody else gets paid more, you suddenly get paid more. 
And I think that that's a good negotiating tactic because it lets you get people for cheaper than they normally would uh, and still keep them happy. Because you don't want to work on something for free and then find out, oh, what do you, the PA is getting 150 bucks a day? Yeah. Like, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. So to have that in the contracts, to have some deferred pay, um, we also gave some equity in the film to some of our key people, like our DP uh, and our Yeah, I designer. think, I mean, the other aspect is that if there's a key crew possession, you know, who you, you need them to make, to help you make the film s- successful, like the cinematographer, production designer, and so forth, they have, you know, they have something to be gained by getting that, that credit and that work experience. Um, so therefore, in that case, you know, they're, they... By default, you tend to be more more open to having deferments for for your pay and whatnot because uh, of what the the credit will mean to you for your career. Versus if you're just you know you're 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 the the AC for the camera department or you're pulling cable, you know you're just there working because you like being on set. But your your career is not going to necessarily have any appreciable impact because you you know did craft services for our film you know so in that True. case those folks which do... wasn't that good to begin with oh boy <laughs> i remember that's... the craft anyway. services and, issues yeah. we could talk about that in a whole episode true and uh, and he probably got paid pretty well when you consider all things yeah. but but anyway but uh, but the point being certain certain roles i think you you can't expect people to work for nothing because the work that they do they they don't have anything to be gained career wise by working for free when you're an actor, you, you, work, you, you work with a lot of people for free because you, you think that in the future that those particular people are going to move up the ladder and then they're going to you know, call on you when they move up the ladder to come do some of their work, which basically never happens because they always work with their own tier, with the own t- their own tier groups. So, like the, the agencies will refer certain actors for them to work with from that point on, and, and then those the people that they worked with a long, long time ago are still you know working at restaurants and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. It's very, very you know very rare that you know a, a director or someone who com- moves up the ladder calls up somebody who they worked on a student film with and said, "Hey, this is it. Get yeah. ready, pack your bags. We're well, going." And well, you know, and the whole thing of actor. Yeah, I mean, I think I think actors. It's a whole other thing because. Just it's so difficult yeah, to it's... to be a working actor, let alone being one of the select few that you know become household names, and then also working for you know low pay or no pay, and then you know there's SAG or or not and whatnot. But I think that that's a whole other it's a whole other realm it's... that is its own set of challenges. Yeah, you have, you have you have you know thousands and thousands of people who are willing to work, and then. Um, when you keep lowering the price and lowering the stakes and they're still willing to work, you get to zero and people are still willing to work. And so I don't understand how SAG has gotten <clears throat> as low in day rate as they have. It's like, like 125? It's 125 a day for under like $2 million, which if you're, if you're on the upper end of that, you're making them film yeah. for $2 million, yeah. 125 a day for it's, it's turn It's turned acting into a hobby. Yeah, it's super low. And yeah. to make mm. matters worse, and this is this, this like sad could be a whole episode by itself, but in order to get health coverage, you have 25, to, yeah, you have to make 25 grand. <laughs> so if, and if you make 20 grand, you don't get health nope. coverage. No. Nope. And so it, it makes it so hard for yeah. actors to make a living. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to discourage people. Is it 1%? Ten percent, one percent of actors. One percent of actors, probably. Yeah, that's yeah. a ridiculous statistic. Yeah, what I don't it's a like, joke. and again, we can get into sack later. But I don't like that you can you can make twenty four thousand dollars. Twenty four thousand, right? Ninety nine hundred ninety nine. Ninety cents. But the production still paid pension and health for you into the into the guild and that you, you don't get anything yeah oh yeah right and right. i don't like that the the bigger issue is that if there were if there's a role that you're just not the right look for it doesn't matter how great of an actor you are you know yeah. if they oh, need if fact. they're yeah. specifying someone of a certain age and appearance or skill set or whatever that that is and you're not that then unless they're willing to change that script there's yeah. you know it's you know you can't fit you know a square a peg into a round hole, you know? It's not to yeah. say that there's anything wrong with the round hole or that square peg. It's just not a match for yeah, what someone is looking for. But the actors don't take it that way. 
after a while they do down the road they understand what happens once they start getting you know into the really down deep into how this business works but when they first start out and for you know years on after that they don't understand that they think it is them they think it is their performance why aren't you choosing me because I, I just nailed this audition out of the park mm. and it's not that it's it's not you could have done you could have done a, a fucking fantastic job but you may be taller than the main character. Yeah, or right. May, or yeah. You, you may not be a fit for, you know, for the whole grand scheme of things. Your look might may, might be off. And, and, and it's just the, all the stars have to align in order for you to get a role. And it just makes it that more difficult, that more, more frustrating and that more upsetting. And I think once actors kind of understand that it's all you have to do is go in, do the best job you can, and then just... You know, it's out of your hands. It it's done because there's nothing you can do about it. It's not there's up so to much you. that goes into it. So much, so much. It sucks, but it's you but know the, that, that's life. Is. That's yeah. the that you know that's the job you chose. But to bring it back, you know, we you, Eric touched on something earlier on about uh, how a lot like the the AC doesn't really have anything to gain if the film does well. If the film does horrible. It doesn't matter. They showed up. They did their work. They're out. Um, but I think there is still something to be gained career-wise for knowing those people. And that's that's why you see a lot of people that work for 10 years and then get their big break because they've spent 10 years working and meeting people and you know rising up with those people and continuing to get work and stuff. And I think a lot of people just do a short film, say, oh, those people suck, never going to see them again and leave. But you should keep in contact with those people. Like yeah. <clears throat> Networking is, you know, is a dirty word to some people, but... In the film business, it's you got to do it. You got to stay in touch with people, even if it's just you know. But we could definitely do a whole a, a <clears throat> whole podcast on that. But yeah, I mean, it's it is it's all about the people that you know, and all the jobs that I've gotten have all been through the relationships which I've made o- over the years, oh. and it's not networking like you. I think the old school concept of networking is still what people think of, yeah. where you're going to a room and you're handing out business cards, and it doesn't. At least with and with film, it doesn't work that way, and um, it is just about the people that you work with and getting to to know them, them getting to know you, you you doing the work and doing a great job, but also you being easy to work with, and yeah, and you know it's funny going back to the visual effects. You know, it was actually a, a few days after uh, after you had done those posts that somebody I'd emailed a friend of uh, a friend of mine that owns a VFX house just not about working with us because I just didn't want to throw that out there, but just to see how he was doing. So I'd heard some things. And a few days later, he emails me asking if I know somebody that they were looking to hire somebody on a full, as a full-time staffer with, with health insurance and this is and that. And, you know, just think if any of those people through our job post, maybe that had responded, if we had more than two responses and it was somebody that I thought maybe would have been good for that job, I could have, I could have referred them, yeah. you know? So, I mean, I mean, I get asked for help for different shows all the time, and it's not usually free shows. It's shows that are paying people, and you know, and that's the thing. Like you, I think sometimes too, people think, oh, well, I'm just going to be buddies with this director or this person or or, or that person, um, but you know, you sort of have to build relationships with everybody, and. You know, it's not unheard of for someone to ask a cinematographer who they think might be a great editor that they worked with. You know, uh, yeah. it goes all sorts of different ways, you know. Um, you never know where your next job is going to come from. Yeah, It's going to come from somebody that you know or somebody that knows who you know. I had, um year, years ago, uh, I had attended, when, when, when 3D was becoming an even bigger thing, Sony was doing these training classes on the, the lot, and they were offering for free, so I went just to to check it out i met a couple guys there super cool to hang out with and i kind of had kept in, in touch with one a bit but you know some time had gone by and like if it was two years later he emailed me out of the blue asking me if i was available to edit a feature he was raising money on and i was just like wow yeah you know, the fact that you had remembered me and because th- i figured you know this guy works you know he he's all he was working he should know plenty of, of folks but whatever it was he had reached out to to uh, me about that and you know yeah you just never know when it's going to happen how much time might pass all that matters is that if you're going to take a job no matter what the job is no matter what well, no matter how much you have or have not gotten paid you do a great job you get along with folks. You you stay in touch. They will think of you later when there's an 
op- opportunity. Yeah, and well, people good looking. No, I mean Eric. Eric's got <laughs> plenty of work. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think that when you're first starting out, and young people especially, they think that a year or two is a long period of time to not hear from somebody. Uh-huh. But I've, you know, I recently emailed somebody that I haven't talked to in four years, and we got coffee, and it was like no time passed. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, they're not going to remember me. I'm not going to hit them up, but you, you need to. You need to stay in touch. And, <clears throat> I, you know, Eric, you said that people think of old school networking. And I think in the film industry, it's more just building relationships and being genuine with people. Yeah. The, the hey, here's my business card. Can you, give, can you give me a job? It's so disingenuous that I think people <clears throat> do that too much when they're starting out. And it comes back to bite them in the end. And I think the other thing is don't, don't be shy for asking for favors. I know a couple film filmmakers and directors that are like, I want to make my film, but I don't know, I can't pay anybody, and it's a no budget thing, and you know, how am I getting anybody to work for free? And it's like, ask them. Like, you've been in this business for ten years. Ask for a favor. No, nah, you're right. There was a there was some uh, composer fr- friend of mine I've known for a long time, and we we worked together a bunch of years back, but we haven't worked since. But we you know we'll grab lunch and stuff, and I was updating her on what I've been up to, and. She had said, and I mentioned about there was a short film or something I worked on, but I wasn't going to hit them up because I wanted to wait until I had a, a project where I could pay them, you know, because I know this person, she's done it for a long time. She's great, and I just didn't want to waste her time. And, and she looks me straight in the eye and goes, you know what? You can always ask. Always ask. Might not be able to, to uh, do it, but always feel like you can ask for that favor. Yeah. And and I was really taken <clears throat> taken aback by that because you know i mean which was really great you know i mean uh, because yeah you're right i mean people want if people like you they want to help you out and while you think your request might be unreasonable someone else you know might yeah it might be a lot but they're willing to uh to do it yeah and the worst that they can say is no i asked a friend for a favor for another friend recently and he said i only do favors for people that i know directly like i know you're vouching for yeah, them yeah, but yeah, i only yeah. do favors for people that i know like if you need something i'll do it for you right but i'm not gonna do it for your friend and i'm like totally respect that i get that you know yeah yeah third third I, i've also found the same thing third, third party favors third party papers just don't work and plus on top of that you gotta you know it's your rep reputation for whom you, you whom you're referring to and then the other aspect that was that maybe you have a, a project that you would you'd rather have help on your project then having your friend get help, and then you suddenly realize that you need help, and then you've already cashed in like a yeah. a a, uh, a favor, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. know about you guys. That I don't. Wacky. I don't keep track of favors. Like I'm not like he owes me a favor. Well, I remember you know? them because not too many people do them. Yeah, but like, yeah, if true. if you do something for a friend, you're not gonna be like he owes me a favor. He's gonna he has to do something for me now. It's just no. Mm-hmm. And that this industry is just. You do stuff for other people. They do stuff for you. Everybody's working on different projects all the time. It's a super I think the only time, time you were, I don't think anybody, the only time it gets kept track of is when the favors never, when the requests don't stop. Yeah, when they you never know, balance. When when there's that project or person you know that you're just always asking you, can you do do this, do, do this, do this, and while you want to help them. You also sort of look back and be like, well, what is kind of what's all transpired? You know, what what transpired since the last time that we yeah. worked on it, and the time prior to, to to that? So I think you can ask too many times. Yeah, but and I think it's to our point in the beginning, like it's self awareness. It's you need to be aware that you're asking too much, and yeah. that you're potentially straining your relationship by constantly asking and never reciprocating. That's true. The <clears throat> reciprocity is also a big a big deal and if somebody says well i don't know how i could possibly help you because i only do xyz that's not a good answer right because yeah. you know everybody everybody knows a lot of people you know and so there's always some way that somebody can can, can help you can help you out yeah uh we're almost out of time is there any i mean i know that we kind of touched on a couple of the nego- negotiating tactics we didn't really talk too much about where we find people but for the most part when we when we cast and crewed up when we cast 11th hour, it was mostly breakdown services. Well, it was breakdown services and word well, of we mouth. didn't hire those people. We hired the people from... That's true. Three quarters... No, almost all but one. Yeah. We hired Chloe through a breakdown service. Yeah. Everybody else came through recommendations yeah. from somebody else. Um, 
and it was great. Yeah. You know, and that, that's another thing is the person that recommended them was someone on our crew. Yeah. But, I mean, aside from that, it was a lot of word of mouth for the, for the crew. We hired our DP. We hired our designer just based on prior projects that we met somehow. Um, again, working on, like, a no-budget thing. That's how I met Kim was I worked with her on some no like super low budget no budget project and I've worked with her on every project since and it's you know I really enjoy working with her and that's why I keep yeah. bringing her back no she's a hard worker <clears throat> yeah yeah she definitely works hard um and uh it's okay she doesn't listen this weekend <laughs> <laughs> no it's true <laughs> no she is she works hard and that's that's the reason why I keep wanting to bring her back um I don't think we put out any uh, we didn't put out any ad for crew, right? Well, no, no. and we should. I mean, the other thing, once you hire each department head, it's on them to sort of find their the rest of their crew because they're yeah. gonna have people that that they like. And we to were work lucky with, enough you know? to have department heads that had a lot of experience that knew that had you know gone through it and had a group of people that they already knew to bring along with them. Yeah. Instead of hiring a bunch of newbies who said, "I have a friend. I think he's good or yeah. she's good." <laughs> I'll, you know, bring them along, bring them, yeah. see how it all works out. Eh, no good. Yeah, but we <laughs> had. I mean, we had craft some, services was craft uh, service, yeah. there's craft. We, but that's you know. <laughs> that's but you know what though? But actually, it's funny because we should should do that again next time because craft services, it should be a pretty no brainer job just because you know exactly what you need to be mm-hmm. doing and you're told when you need to be doing it. But apparently, that's. More, it's easily said than than yeah than done. I think we could wrap that into an episode about like stuff that we kind of learned on set that that we would things change. that you think should be simple yeah that turn but, out uh, to involve a lot more work yeah than you well, realize. what's the um what what's the saying that we always that we always used to say it, it it's all, it, the water tower oh yeah that's a great story uh you want to tell it real quick. I don't know if Eric's, oh, I don't you know if I've heard, heard the water tower. So we yeah. were so we were we were filming a short how many years ago? Stranded. It was four oh, years ago. So yeah, four no. years ago we were filming this short called Stranded. We had found a location that was in the middle of nowhere. Just nowhere. We had to drive two hours to get there. We I don't had to drive two hours to get there. There wasn't a soul. There wasn't a car that was coming down the road. There was nothing. Yeah. But there was one thing. And there was a water tower. And it was directly across from the location where we were shooting across the street, across the road. Two lane, uh, two lane road, two lane road. Yeah, that's right. Um, the first, the first day that we get there. Oh yeah. Now I now I remember. And this. We're going to shoot. <laughs> and this is this was a this was a what? How many pages was this shoot? 10, 15 pages. Ten fifteen pages. <clears throat> so we were going to split it up in two days, yeah. right? Yeah. Seven seven pages. Something a day. like that. Yeah. Um, we get there. And we're going to shoot, and it's the exact same day in the middle of nowhere where nobody is that that water tower was going to be taken down. Yeah. The one day out of the whole year. <laughs> so we had talked to somebody that lived there. We were like, hey, has anybody, did they use this? And they're like, no, it's been untouched for 25 years. <laughs> like, right, this is perfect. We, you know, it's it'll be great for the background. Cool. And the day we show up, big old truck comes down the lane. So the and only things that we could shoot that day were the shots that didn't require any sound. Yeah, because they're and making then, the, as much noise as possible. And then the <laughs> next day was everything else. So basically yeah. two pages in one day yeah. and then 13 pages the next day, yeah. all because of a water tower that's been there for 20 years, two decades, yeah. just decided Untouched. on the day that we were going to shoot yeah. had to come down. And there will always be something that goes wrong. Yeah. That's, that's the takeaway. So that's me. the whole, that's what we always used to say. It's like, hey, yeah. there's always a water tower somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you work through it. That's kind of what indie filmmaking is. That's what filmmaking in general is. Yeah. is you, and we had some great people. Like, we, you know, you handled some of the catering stuff. You had a lot of the catering stuff, actually. Um, handle y- yelling at the <laughs> craft services person. Yeah. yeah. If, well, uh, there was that. if that's what you were talking about. It was. Yeah. Um, but there is always something that's going to go wrong. You have to be ready to, to, you know, figure out how to put out that fire. Yeah. Um, I think the other takeaway, because we're at the end, of the, I think the end of our time is, uh, you, don't be afraid to just go with as small a crew as you can. Like filmmakers think, like first time filmmakers think, we have to, I have to get a thirty person crew and we have to shoot for forty days. It's like, no, you don't. You, you can, you only need a couple of people 
key people to do it. It might take longer and it might not look the best, but you're getting something done. You're making something and, you know, you're going to go well, to I the mean, next thing. Well, I mean, you don't necessarily need it. Well, the more people, the better, because you can move along a lot faster. Yeah. But if you really don't necessarily know what you're doing, having a big crew at on hand isn't going to help you because well, if you can't. Worse. Yeah. If you can't orchestrate where they all need to be to be and what they should be doing, that doesn't help either, especially if they're not necessarily that terribly skilled either. So yeah. I think, you know, a, a small crew running fast and knows what they're doing is always better than a big crew that doesn't know. Yeah. But, but uh, I mean, you look at, a trade-off. Look at, uh, you know, uh, Robert Rodri- Rodriguez's first film. It was yeah. like him and a camera. Same thing with uh, Gareth Edwards. When he made Monster, it was him with a camera, a sound guy, and like a makeup person, and that's it. Yeah, it's um, crazy because that, yeah. that 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 looks like a feature that definitely had a normal size crew on yeah. it. Yeah, and so you don't. I mean, people get stuck in their head, and I. <clears throat> this is a whole other topic, but I get stuck in my head too that something has to be perfect. It has to be big crew. It's got to look the best. The visual effects have to be amazing. But that's not the case. Like, you look, go back and look at some other first time filmmakers' films, and you can see like, oh, that that's actually kind of terrible. That looks really bad. But they did that. They learned. They got to the next thing, you know. Another yeah. topic is, you know, how you grow as a filmmaker. Like, because I made the comment, a year had transpired between our initial shoot and our additional photography shoot, and the additional photography stuff looks amazing. It sounds amazing. It was great. That came out really, really yeah. good. That and was it's, yeah. really, really good stuff. And it's a it's a well written scene. There's a lot of a lot of emotion into it, and it added a lot to the. It's going to add a lot to the film. And that was one year. You know, I can only imagine how much better. It it's at filmmaking we're going to be in five years yeah. after another two films you know so um is there anything else you guys want to touch on when it comes to hiring people some some spots for people to go to like mandy.com is one we went to yeah. which facts. is funny because that was i think i used them a lot when i first moved to la and nothing ever really nothing ever really came from it yeah. for me and so when it came time to posting jobs i mean we kind of i figured when you and ed when we had talked, you and I, that going directly to to these schools would be a great way, you know. And then so there's a certain irony that those didn't pan out in any way, shape, or form. But yet Mandy.com did, which I never would have attributed getting any well, anybody. Yeah. <laughs> also, also when you're when you're asking for what you're asking for in this particular instance, you're not asking for someone to be local. So that that might that, that adds to it as well. Hmm. I mean, you can yeah. get anybody from anywhere who can just you know get the footage yeah. or get what they need and then put in whatever they need to put in. That's true. But that's and, why. And, and you know, it we still we're still you know to be determined whether or not this whole situation works out. I really do hope it does. Yeah. And yeah. I really do hope that this guy is, um, you know, really really contributes to, uh, to the film. It would be a, a blessing in disguise. Um, but when you're talking about local stuff, it's probably, you know, you're probably right about what you're saying about using the site for local stuff. It's a lot easier when you're going, you know, domestic or in, even international yeah. and on a site where you can just outsource things. Yeah. That's why visual effects is getting as cheap as it is because a lot of it is going overseas. Very true. Yeah. Um, Anywhere else that you posted that you think is worthwhile for people to look at? I mean, there's, there's always Craigslist. Which no, is there, not, I mean, there were some Craigslist. of the websites that you had suggested oh were, were either um, paid it was... or they were uh, more on the lines of uh, from the writer slash director. Did you ever look at that stage 32? I did, yeah. Yeah. What yeah, I I signed on to it uh-huh. and stuff like that. Now, now they send me a gazillion emails, <laughs> but it, it's basically a, a script writer's. Oh, was it more geared? Yeah. More, more geared towards the pitch. Yeah. Than it is the crew. Maybe I, I, I didn't look at it. Probably. I don't know. Yeah. Then it was slated.com, which um, is another another one. But it's funny because I was talking to Ty about them recently, and I think on Slated, I'm in the 96th percentile of most experienced people up there, but yet nobody ever emails me. Yeah. If you were new in town, right? Yeah. What would be? What's your best path of getting a break? You know, if you're not even new in town, but like you know, you're new, you're newish. You've been here for a few uh, few years. You got a couple credits under your belt. Are those sites? Is there any? Are or is there any value? I think in the if you're in the first two years of your career of starting, they're probably worth it because the caliber of projects that you're going to get are of that level. Yeah. But after two years of doing that, you should know enough people 
that you can transition just to getting word of mouth and saying, "Hey, I need a job. Do you have anything?" That'd be good. You know, that'd be that'd be good for future reference. When, once we get to a point where we can hire people who, um, I mean, not hire people, but get to know people who are, are at the higher levels of of this business. We call them in, you know, each individual one, and they can go over, you know, their whole process of, of how they started to how they, you know, got to a certain point in the beginning to how they got noticed and to how they are, are working now. And just break it down into groups, where the, whether it be makeup or whether it would be, you know, DPs or um, ADs or, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Because cool. then it would... It would, it would give interest to people who are looking for specific things to go to those episodes. No, for sure. Well, and, but also, um, playing off of what Ed was saying, there should be no reason why, even if you have experience, that you couldn't go up to one of those sites and be on the lookout for the next big talent mm-hmm. that's coming, right? Yeah. That's true. You know, and so therefore, if you're a successful whatever that that is, you know, makeup, production designer, editor, DP... There's no reason why, you know, if you're up there and somebody is looking for that skill, like that you, you shouldn't, that you that you should be getting emails in your inbox saying, oh, wow, you know, Wally Fister, uh, you're open to doing projects for low uh, budget, you know? Yeah. Well, what it does is it, but, in, so, it increases the competition because you're... When you get hired for a job, mm-hmm. you get hired based on the people that you've worked with in the past. Sure. Now, I'm giving you an option where the, it, it's more opened up to people who you may not know of, right. but are equally as qualified. Sure. So now you're looking at a whole you know, spectrum of people, whereas not as I only know four people for this job. Right. And it, it, and, it, and it not only will it increase the competition, but it increases the opportunity, yeah. the quality of opportunity. And 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 that and I think that's in, in unbelievably important is that we increase that equality of opportunity for people to come in and show their show their worth and whether or not they'll be able to work with a certain group of people yeah. instead of saying I know Eric I know Ty and I know Ed that's my pool of people increase the pool increase the competition right. increase the effectiveness and increase the quality of your work yeah. I, I, I don't know. That's just my personal You're right. idea. So then the big question is why, you know, if there were more talented people, not talented, that's the wrong word, but if there's more experienced people up on those sites, do they get tapped? And are the ones that do get tapped, ones that don't? I'm just curious to see what those demographics are. Yeah. Because yeah. It, I, mean, I think it's worth certainly a deeper dive into making a job post on each site, the same job post, and seeing what we get back. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, I think that, that social media in general really opened it up to to the equality that you talked about. Yeah. Because uh, Eric and I met on Twitter five, seven years ago. I've like met that. a lot of people on Twitter that have become really great friends yeah. and coworkers in yeah. some fashion. And it's not, it's something that you should, you know, reach out and try to connect with those people and other people on there. Like we would never have met if it wasn't for me saying something about the South Bay and you saying, hey, I'm in the South Bay too. And that's true. That's yeah. it, you know, and, and from that point on now, you know, we are where we are. Um, Sadly. So, yeah, I was going <laughs> to I was trying to think of a joke, and I was like, no, it's a nice moment. I don't want to. Wanna... Oh, it's a nice warm moment. Yeah. Hugs and kisses. Yeah, I'm the nice guy here. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think that we could we could go on for this for a long time, but we're over our, our time limit. Uh, but, you know, thanks for tuning into the, to the second episode. We're going to get onto a every two-week schedule, so this one will drop. Don't make any promises you can't keep, um, Ty. Hey, er- Ed said, we're doing the stuff when we say we're going to do the stuff. So let's say we're going to do the stuff. A whole podcast about Ed's pet. Uh, you know, that's follow-up that's episode. All three minutes of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so next week's episode will be two weeks from whenever you're listening to this now, I guess. is You can find us on, on social media. We're on we're Exit44ENT on Twitter and Instagram. Exit44 Entertainment on uh, YouTube. And all our porn movies are on Pornhub. <laughs> yeah, well, all of Ed's. Uh, yeah, all, all of Ed's. <laughs> if you would like to consume that, notice the word consume, yeah. uh, go ahead and check those out. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Adios. Next Later. Episode.